especially on a, an evening in the middle of the week. What I'm going to be talking about briefly is really trying to give you the overview of what impacts we've seen in natural systems. And I think it's uh, that we're not, I'm not talk, going to talk about projected changes, I'm going to talk about actual changes. Because I think it's very important to get a sense of what we've already seen in order to try to think about what we're looking at in the future. So to date, there have been five major meta-analyses, and a meta-analysis is, is a single study that puts together data from lots and lots of different published studies. And when we look at these, we, we're now totaling something like 4,000 species being included, and we've got every continent represented and every ocean represented at this point. So these numbers have been very powerful in moving uh, policymakers to action. And what some of the numbers are is that, um, I should say the first, oops, back. The first four have largely been terrestrial, but the most recent analysis was entirely marine. So now we not only have the lands represented, but the oceans as well. And if you look at the proportion of species showing change, really in every study we've got quite a high proportion of species showing some type of change in where they live or when they live over the past 50 to 100 years. And we look at the ones that have shown changes, 82 to 92 percent of those changes are consistent with local or regional climate change. Now that's been a very powerful message that's come across in the IPCC reports as well as national reports and has been part of, of the um, background allowing policymakers to come to decisions about how to define dangerous climate change, and I'm going to be coming to that at the end. What is dangerous climate change? Okay, so what have we seen so far? So far, what we've seen in an absolute sense is warming has been, uh, this is total warming. Warming has been much stronger on land, that's the darker red colors than in the oceans, which is probably why a lot of those earlier analyses were on land species. But uh, a recent group that I was part of, led by uh, Evira Polachanska and Tony Richardson, <clears throat> and um, uh, a paper that, uh, that Mike Burroughs led, helped to look at this in a different way, which is to look, instead of at the absolute temperature change, look at something called the velocity of climate change. And by this, you get a very different picture. What we were looking at was looking at the rate of movement of the temperature through space and time. And when you look at it this way, what you see is the oceans don't change temperature very rapidly. As you move through the oceans, it takes you have to move a very long way before you get into a different temperature space. And so if you're, say, a sea urchin and you experience a little bit of warming, if you're trying to maintain a certain temperature, you've actually got to move yourself a very long way to keep that temperature, even if there's only been a little bit of warming. Whereas if you're, say, a reindeer on land, you may only have to move a hundred a few hundred feet or a hundred meters uphill to keep your temperature space. So this gives you a very expectation of what kind of changes you expect and suddenly you see that some changes in the Arctic are actually very slow whereas in an absolute sense the Arctic has warmed more than the rest of the world. When you look at the velocity of these temperature lines it's, it can be quite slow in the Arctic that there are moderate changes through much of, of the ocean and the land, but actually the oceans are warming more, or changing faster than the land, even though in an absolute sense they're warming less. And suddenly the tropics come out as having very, very fast change. So suddenly you have a different set of expectations, and what we see when we look at responses of species is that indeed they are following the velocity of these temperature shifts, not the absolute temperature change. They're trying to maintain their temperature space by moving geographically to keep their space and moving in line with those movements of temperatures. So the marine systems are changing much faster than land, uh, which is what you expect from velocity of climate change, moving poleward at 75 kilometers per decade compared to terrestrial systems, at 6 to 17 kilometers per decade. But these are averages. And at the extreme ends, we're seeing much, much faster rain shifts. So cod and this diatom have moved 200 to 400 kilometers in a single decade. And when you look at these extreme rain shifts, you're seeing shifts that are just as fast on land. For example, the Purple Emperor has moved northward more than 200 kilometers in the last five years in Europe. <coughs> 
And what's really interesting is these very rapid expansions that I've just mentioned actually are also predicted by the velocity of climate change. And if we look here, what you see is the, the temperature isotherms have been moving very rapidly out of the North Sea and been fairly stable up around Iceland. And this perfectly matches what we've seen in the movements of the Atlantic cod. It used to be quite abundant in the North Sea. It's almost entirely gone from the North Sea, and yet now it's still quite abundant around Iceland. Same thing with the purple emperor butterfly. Uh, the, the velocity of climate change predicts the Baltics will be a barrier, shown by these pink bars. And indeed, the purple emperor took 10 to 20 years to shift over the Baltic after warming began in this area. But once it got into Sweden and Finland, Velocity of climate change predicted it should rapidly expand, and it did and did, and that uh, went more than 200 kilometers in just five years, expanding northward through Sweden once it had effectively managed to shift over the Baltics. So this is a very useful way of looking at the world and very useful to conservation biologists because we often don't have detailed data on what species are doing, but we do have this detailed data on what the temperature is doing. And this gives us a way to sort of predict what areas of the globe might be sources of species, where species might be moving out, might be areas that might be refugia, where, where the, the velocity of climate change is relatively stable, and that might be places where biodiversity could sort of hang out until we hopefully cool the climate again. Now, the other major type of change we're seeing are changes in timing of events, primarily spring events. Uh, and we've got a lot more data on this, and so we're starting to see large differences amongst different types of groups. Amphibians are changing the fastest, advancing their breeding by eight days per decade. Birds and butterflies are advancing faster than our herbs. And in the marine system, fish and zooplankton are advancing faster than phytoplankton. So this is starting to get interesting because it's suggesting that predators are advancing faster than their prey, insects are advancing faster than their host plants. So important interactions between species may be starting to get out of sync. Now, these big global meta-analyses I've been talking about um, have shown about half of species have changed where they live and about two-thirds of species have advanced their spring timing. These are enormous numbers considering we've only had about 0.6 to 0.8 degrees centigrade warming, depending on which study you're looking at. But we're starting to realize that life is more complex. So these, this other set of the, the, the half of species that appear not to be moving or going counter to what we expected, and the third of species that, or quarter of species that are not changing their timing in spring or even delaying their timing, we always tended to kind of shunt those aside as not being, you know, being a minority that's not the big picture. But it turns out as we look into those categories, we're actually seeing that those are not insensitive to climate change. They actually are quite sensitive to climate change, just in more complex ways than we expected. For instance, a recent analysis we did of changes in timing of spring and flowers, flowering in England. Long data set, for more than 40 years. And we did a much more sophisticated analysis looking not just how they're responding to spring temperature, but how they're responding to temperature the whole year and a half before that, that event. And what we find is you know, almost three quarters of them are only sensitive to spring temperatures. They respond to warm springs by advancing. And for example, the field maple has advanced its flower, oops, sorry, has advanced its flowering um, by about two weeks over that 44 year period. But there's another almost 20% that show no change overall. And when we look at those, we actually see that they're very sensitive to spring warming. They advance in a warm spring. But these are also species that require chilling in the wintertime. They require something called vernalization in the winter. If they don't get a cold winter, if winter is too warm, they tend to delay their flowering. They're waiting around for that cold winter to reset their clocks to tell them winter is here, then it's, it warms up in spring, and then they'll start going. Eventually, they do flower, but it takes them a long time. And so the change that we observe in flowering is actually a, a combined effect of this advance, warming springs causing advancements, but warming winters causing delays going in the opposite direction. And what we see is no change. And in fact, these species are very sensitive to climate change. So a very simple estimate, what's gone into those big meta-analyses, estimates that 72% of species 
in this study responded to climate change, when in fact a more sophisticated analysis showed that 90% of species were responding to climate change. <clears throat> this is happening in geographic distributions as well. So usually with warming, what we expect is poleward and upward rain shifts. As it warms, things move towards the poles, away from the equator, and up the mountains. In California, a very large data set on plants showed that almost three-quarters of them were moving downslope. Yet California's had a very strong warming trend. So what's going on? Well, again, the authors did a more sophisticated analysis and looked not just at temperature, but at rain and snowfall. And what they found is that that area of California had, had a large increase in rain and snowfall. So in the uh, valleys of California are very dry historically. And this increase in rain and snow has allowed these montane plants to expand downhill into this historically dry valley. Again, in the simple meta-analysis, this would have put it been put in as a response counter to climate change. And yet, with a more sophisticated analysis, we find out that, in fact, these plants are responding to climate change, just in a different way from what we expect from this very kind of simple way of looking at the world. Now, I've been talking about birds and butterflies and fish and trees, because those are the organisms we have a lot of good data on. But there are a lot of organisms out there, wild organisms, that a lot of them are very small that we don't have very good data on. And a lot of these small organisms are parasites or bacteria that can cause diseases of plants, animals, and indeed humans. And we would expect those to behave in the same way as the rest of biodiversity. You know, wild species, ought, uh, we don't have an expectation that a particular group will not respond to climate change. There's no theoretical reason for that. And yet, we have very little data on these very important organisms that can cause diseases. So we're just starting to get some indications that indeed these disease organisms are actually also responding to climate change. For example, this study out of the, out of the Baltic Sea uh, looked at an increase in uh, cases of Vibrio infection. Vibrio is a genus of a bacteria. Many of the species are very harmful to humans. And what they noted is that the Baltics have had a very strong increase in, in the temperature of the ocean, <laughs> and that has been these increases in temperature shown in the dotted lines have been very strongly related to increases in cases of Vibrio poisoning or Vibrio infection that have reached hospitals. So humans going into hospital because of getting infected by this organism. And this is a serious health problem because these um, Vibrio vinificus, which is one of the particularly bad species, if you get infected via bathing in the ocean and having a wound and getting it into the wound, more than 15% of the time uh, that ends in death. And if you get infected by eating seafood that has consumed the Vibrio and it's built up in its tissues, and you actually get food poisoning and go to the hospital, more than 50% of the time that is fatal. So we're, we don't have a lot of good data on human disease organisms, but we are starting to see suggestions that indeed these are responding to the same climate changes as the birds and butterflies and trees. So in summary, we've, these simple big meta-analyses have shown about half the species shifted where they live, two-thirds have shifted when they live, We've got data on every major group and every system around the world, but new research indicates that these big numbers are actually underestimates of the real proportion of species responding to climate change. So what I want to end with <coughs> is discussing about what is dangerous climate change. And in uh, the Copenhagen meetings, COP15 back in 2009, the world agreed, made a formal agreement, that dangerous climate change was two degrees centigrade. So we've already had about 0.8. And what they're saying is we should limit it to another 1.2 in order not to have dangerous climate change. But I'd argue in the impacts community, as many of us are seeing much more rapid changes, much more in a high magnitude of changes, and a much higher proportion of changes than we expected as more and more studies are done, we've been questioning whether two degrees is actually too much. So I've been very pleased that policymakers have been responding to this information from the impacts community. And in the most recent COP meeting, COP21 in December, there, uh, the agreement still stuck to the two-degree dangerous climate change limit, 
but made a, a very strong call for the international community to push for a 1.5 degree limit in future agreements. So hopefully, if, if the policy talk is followed by policy action, we can actually continue to have the biodiversity that we've enjoyed on Earth. Thank you. Thank you.